Welcome, everybody. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Always nice to see these lovely, familiar faces, people from all over the place. Take the time to see everybody. Hi. Wow. Sorry. John Hart. Susan, Amanda, Julie, Larry, Lowell, mm. hi, Pari. <laughs> hi, Susan. Hi, everybody. <laughs> I have to say different names. Oh. Huh. Um, Jesse, will you let us know when we should start or? Yeah, do we... sure. There's people kind of trickling in, yeah. but I think, um, you know, maybe in a minute you could start. Okay. Somewhere. It's fun to just keep saying hi yeah. to you by Amy. <laughs> I love looking at everybody. I can't help it. I'll just spend the whole time looking at everybody. Great. Quilt of yogis. Yeah. Oh, okay. What did that, how did that happen? Oh. Molly and Matt, Cynthia. There. Kim. What Kim. happened? Uh oh. oh. There. Hmm. All right, Michelle, I think you could get started. Okay. I'll keep track of folks as they come in. Well, it's... Um, Hi, Rebecca. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to just say that um, it's really moving to me to um, start feeling that there are a group of us meeting every Sunday now and familiar faces. And so that sense of taking refuge and sanctuary together is feeling like it's uh, deepening and um, really wonderful. So I especially like getting to see you. Uh, we all like the um, feeling of connection and the power of being together. So we like to begin by sitting together because that sense of um, coming together through the meditation practice and the silence is very meaningful. So we'll, we'll start right in whatever time zone you're in. I can see some of you are in the dark and some of you are in the light. Um, I hope you've had a good week. Riding all the currents of the range of joy and sorrow that we're living in. And it's helpful to, if you find it helpful to close your eyes, you, you're welcome to open them at times or whenever you want. Um, but we tend to recommend starting with just checking into your body posture, especially for those of you who are new to the meditation practice and just checking your body posture to see if you have a balance of feeling relaxed, but also upright. And you might take a few deeper breaths just to connect with um, the fact of us all breathing. And landing 
letting the attention land inside your skin. And let the attention go anywhere in the body that it's naturally drawn at first. So this could feel more like you're listening to music, more like a symphony where you just let the attention go wherever it's called in our body. And we're shifting to the non-conceptual attention and the, a very kind attention, just remembering to make a commitment for the duration of the sitting to see if you can be caring or tender or kind with whatever appears. And rather, wherever your attention does land, rather than think, oh, that's my face or my knee or my foot, you just pause and see if the attention can connect just with what's there without any words. And we check to see, can we receive? Is the attention receptive or non-receptive? Meaning can the attention relax there and receive whatever sensations are revealing themselves? It's like life is revealing itself moment by moment within our bodies. So of course there will be thoughts that appear about what we're connecting with. And it, it could be as simple as the word elbow or toe. And that's fine. Of course, words will, will come. And you just let those words come and go. And you bring your attention just to connect again. It might be for a few seconds or longer with this wordless emergence of life itself. And you can get that sense that it might be that you're with one body sensation or several for a few seconds and the attention might shift to another place in the body and you just land there more. It's more like you notice like a butterfly going from flower to flower. So again, there's that sense of, of listening to the stream of music, but it's the, the stream of the life of our body. And sometimes that can feel overwhelming or too much, this flow of sensations calling the attention and sometimes it's helpful to let the attention just settle for example within our hands and just taste the difference you just let the attention land within our hands for a while And even that can be a lot of different sensations to pay attention to. It could be you land in one hand. You just experiment and see. 
that at times letting the attention settle within one small area can bring more calm and stillness. And sometimes it's easier to notice maybe the, these are words, but you get to start noticing maybe some range of sensation, not the word hand or palm or fingers, thumb, but it could be heaviness or light pressure. You don't have to say those words, but if you start noticing, it could be warmth or tingling. And in this practice, again, at times when you notice anything, you just see what happens to it when you notice it. Does it change? Get more intense, disappear slowly or quickly. And in this case, when we're starting to let the attention anchor with one place, you start to see how the attention can go off into the past or future. We're thinking about what we're noticing conceptually. We're not trying to get rid of thinking, but you see that you can just invite the intention to come back. to a, a kind of steady stillness and calm. And from this place of being with the sensations in our hands, we can notice the movement of the breath at our abdomen it's very close by and you don't have to force the attention. You can actually, I often just put my hands on my belly for a while and just, it's like listening for something very close and very far away at the same time. You just notice these swells like waves of movement just like ocean water moving with a wave going through. And you see, if your hands are there, you don't have to force anything. You just let these sensations come into the hands. Just like you're deep in the water. And again, you, you check to see there's the word breath or movement. But you check to see if the attention can be as close to that movement as it's happening without forcing, receiving that rising of the swell of life of movement and the disappearing gradually of that swell and movement. It's just like paddling out to catch a wave. And if you notice thinking's happening, you, you just don't have to start at the beginning of the breath. You just, wherever you find yourself, you can drop the attention back into, maybe you find yourself in the middle of the falling of the movement.
And if a sound or sounds call the attention, you'll see it's traceless. You'll, just like a thought, the sound might, you'll be there with the sound. You check to see if you can receive the textures and vibrations of the sound. It might be the word car or bird. comes through the thought stream, that's fine. And you just shift to seeing if you can be right with that movement of the sound. You catch it as it's moving. It's just like catching the wave of the breath. You catch the wave of the sound until it disappears or is no longer calling, no longer predominant. You come back to the hands. And you can notice the thinking just like sound. It's the sound of our voice. So you're in a, it's like a soundtrack of body sensations, the music of our body of aliveness, the music of sound and that internal sound of our voice talking to us. Oh, the sound of a bird or a car, the sound of a thought, body sensations. And if any emotions appear, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, that range again of joy and sorrow. If you can, you see if you can go, oh, that's, oh, that's just sadness, or that's just enjoyment, that's just happiness anger and let the this it's like the emotion can come and go just like the, the breath the swell of the movement of emotion it's not ours not me or mine and there's the word fear or anxiety but just like the word thumb or hand or breath, it doesn't really describe it, the experience. So we stay connected with our bodies as an emotion moves through. It could be just a whisper of a thought, a light tingling in the heart. or a huge wave coming and going by itself. And if something becomes too intense to be with, you just come back to your hands. Come to steady, calm awareness. And check to see if there's any kindness. It's abiding in our sixth or sense awareness as best we can.
abiding in this kind awareness of life itself.
Just checking in with the quality of your awareness itself. If there's any sense of quiet connection. With all that is appearing moment by moment. You see if you can ju <clears throat> just let yourself be in that quiet connection, felt sense. Not trying to get rid of anything or get anything, but just letting your body be, sounds be, thoughts be, emotions be. And with that quiet abiding, could be some care, kindness, just let that kind of wash through you, inside your skull, like inside your head. It's like a wash inside your head, down through your neck. Whatever words, it can be just peaceful, quiet, or kind, tender through your chest and arms, tip of your fingers, torso, hips, legs and feet. Not including all the beings living around you. And on this planet, Experiencing this quiet, kind connection. Breathing with all living beings everywhere with tenderness. Connection. Peace. Receiving that peace and offering it. May we all be <clears throat> kind and peaceful of heart. Thank you, Michelle. For the <clears throat> past few months uh, that we've been here in Hawaii, that um, Michelle, Stephen, and I have
been grounded here uh, because of the you know reality of all of our situations. Um, it's given us, amongst other things, the opportunity to go work on um, a piece of land that the organization owns up in the northern part of this island in Kohala. And uh, there's a lot of pieces of that that land that require a lot of engagement. Um, but we've had the opportunity recently to spend more time in the part of the land that has a, the Hawaiian word for it is lo'i. Uh, it's a ancient terracing uh, by the Halava stream uh, under which, you know, for centuries, millennia, uh, taro was grown. And uh, apparently it's quite a productive taro growing area um, in its time. And so this, this lo'i, there are, I think in the last kind of archeological survey, there's maybe about 11 terraces uh, right at the, the bottom of the stream before it enters the ocean. And it's quite powerful as you might imagine. And um, given, given our a lifestyle and reality of having to, you know, be on the road a lot to teach and traveling quite a bit and coming and attending to the land and these sort of in-between moments for many years. It's been quite amazing to be able to go out more regularly, you know, to each week go to the to the Lo'i and and just try to tend to it, try to care for it. It's it's been through quite a long period of time of um, not being cared for uh, the sugar plantations that kind of bought up all of the land up there for many years um, tended to plow over and kind of demolish any ancient structures including lots of temples and sacred areas um, that were up on the plateaus the lo'i was saved largely because it's in a gulch which wasn't useful for um, sugarcane production uh, but, you know, cattle and pigs and just the forces of the wild have uh, really taken it over over many years. And um, we've been in a very, you know, tender place of wanting to protect it, care for it, um, but also not mismanage it, you know, because it's of such important cultural value uh, here. And so being present here in a different way has allowed us to feel the sense of obligation and, and um, responsibility and, and capacity to, to go, you know, each week and just basically be weeding, you know, or just pulling out vines and um, cutting down invasive trees and, uh, and just listening, you know, spending a lot of time working, uh, but also just, it's a very quiet, beautiful place beside the stream. Most of the stream <clears throat> is not actually, uh, the stream isn't really running right now. It's not a full, full year stream, um, but there is a spring uh, just upstream a little bit from, from where the Lo'i is and it's, it's providing some water. Uh, um, down through. So it's a very quiet, beautiful place. I thought uh, when I was preparing, I thought I might get fancy with Zoom and try to uh, do a little slideshow, but I think that'll wait maybe for uh, another time. People who've been to our website or, you know, come and sat with us in different ways have, have heard about uh, the land and the low E and our our dreams for it. And it's amazing the sense of um, when we're there, there's a very powerful and palpable sense of responsibility. But I wouldn't say that any of us really feel that we own it. Um, ownership, of course, is like a very complicated notion. And 
really it's more about the relationship between people about things in regard to things versus the actual relationship between people and things. Um, it's a very important part of our teaching, of our tradition, this understanding of non-ownership and the aspiration actually to live in that in a very powerful way, to really recognize that the mind will tend to grab onto things as me and mine, grab onto the body, grab onto thoughts, grab onto emotions, grab onto stories. Um, and it's understandable that it does that, but, but upon examination, there's this much deeper aspect of reality to know that we, there really is an ownership over any uh, phenomena that is conditioned, you know, that if ownership meant you had any control over anything, you can see that it doesn't exist. You know, we have um, the power to manipulate some things in the body, in the mind, in the world around us, but we don't have the power to uh, stop nature from being in charge, uh, to prevent the the natural forces of reality and all of the forces of the world around us from stopping to act. So there's a very powerful way that we, when we're working in this land and digging in the dirt and, you know, being very careful to not um, rearrange anything yet, any stones or rebuild. It's like a very slow process. I think we're all aware of that this will be This is a very powerful sense of responsibility and carefulness around that. And um, along with that understanding really deeply that there's nothing about it really that is ours uh, besides the, the responsibility and, and even the ownership piece of it, you know, there's like, a, we can't really afford to keep doing this in this way for long you know it's a there's a lot of needs of that land there's not a lot of um we don't have a lot of resources on an organization there's the very real possibility that we won't own that land uh at some point in the future not too far in the future perhaps if we can't you know find a way to um support our uh responsibility around it but even with that sense of like knowing that we may not own this land at some point soon, we may not ever uh, be the recipients of the fruits that are grown there. We were very aware that we're the recipient, recipients of our own actions in that process, that there's the responsibility to care for this place, to care for these stones, to care for the, um, reality of this land um, and all of its manifestations in terms of practically and culturally and uh, individually and in relationship with community, all of these pieces feel very alive to us. And I think that it's something that we all can um, relate to in, in some ways, that there's um, ways that, you know, we don't care for a child based on the expectation that we're going to control it that we're gonna get something out of it. Uh, we don't care for an elder for either of those same reasons, right? That we think we're gonna be able to own them or control them or get something out of it. It's, it's an understanding that this is the right thing to do and it's our thing to do. And that's actually it. And we understand that there is a value in it that is immeasurable in terms of the goodness and qualities that it creates and cultivates in our own hearts and minds, the mysterious qualities that it cultivates in the world downstream from our actions that we might not always be able to see or witness or um, bear witness to, but, but that we have confidence in the goodness and the, the fruit that the wholesome integrity of these actions bears in the world. There's um, been some interesting research recently just this past week around the um, 
very old relationships <clears throat> that are now kind of proven between the people of Polynesia and the people of South America um, long before a Western contact. It started with the question around the sweet potato, which is so important in Polynesia, but is is um, endemic and native to to the Americas. And also the questions of of really having a sense that chickens might have arrived in South America uh, a little earlier than the Spaniards, and and some mysteries around that. So um, there's now you know scientific kind of evidence around this exchanges and <clears throat> connections and relationships and um, mingling between people you know centuries before Western contact and <clears throat> uh, probably unrelated is is the but it's something I've been reading up on as <clears throat> is that the, you know, the, the Andean people also are um, terrace builders in quite a powerful way. <clears throat> um, it's a very ancient part of many of the agricultural systems there. And then in particular, of course, the Inca um, as this kind of last dominant empire that, that built through uh, up until the sort of time of, of conquest, um, it was these incredible irrigation systems, terraces, water flowing, um, mechanical wonders that um, they were able to manifest throughout the empire. <clears throat> it's very powerful to start to understand a little bit more about the, the technical pieces, but also the kind of the cosmology of it, the, the much deeper spiritual understanding of, of what some of these, these places and these systems meant um, in terms of, you know, these canals, these irrigation, these terraces, these walls as things that were spiritually significant as well as uh, practically agriculturally significant and um, significant for empire in a certain way as well. There's a Quechua word, tinkui, which um, is a name given to the, the places where all kinds of complementary forces meet whether they're opposing in battle or whether they're unifying in, um, you know, marriage, um, a place where, you know, inflow meets outflow, where one world meets another. Um, there's all kinds of levels of dimensionality to this, this concept and the importance of those places. And, and one of the very powerful ways really continuing throughout Indian cultures is um, this understanding of where the streams, the rivers converge into their place of kind of maximum input. And then where do they then diverge again into the terraces and the irrigation and aqueducts. And to understand these, these powerful places where as one way of framing it um, traditionally would be where um, nature meets culture, where the the wildness of life and of uh, reality and of the natural world um, comes to a head, is met with this sort of human force, and then is channeled in various directions, you know, for uh, for various purposes, and that there's a very profound understanding of these places as being important spiritual places. Um, and places where the um, there's kind of miraculous and um, very powerful potential. They're sacred places that require a lot of tending to, that require a lot of care, require a lot of um, appreciation for. You'll see in 
Incan architecture similar the where a lot of the um, these beautifully formed walls are built on top of naturally forming stones. And so again, it's this way that 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 sort of symbolism, that aspect of like nature mingling with culture, uh, and these these boundaries and the places of of relationship between those things are uh, formalized and uh, activated, and um, where they have very powerful um, spiritual significance. And so there's a way that we hold this practice in a very similar light that we understand as michelle was saying these streams of experience that are that are coming down upon us right from the ear door the eye door the nose door the mouth door the body door the mind door um I'm trying to think if i missed one or not but these six uh sensitivities that we receive as these streams of, of wilderness, right? Of, of uncontrollability, of kind of unfathomable complexity and wildness at each, each sense store, the, the, the nature, right? Of all of these dhammas arising and passing. And then they, they come into this uh, tinkui, right? This, this point of convergence here in this present moment where we suddenly have responsibility for them. We suddenly have, we find ourselves the recipients of all of these streams. And then this responsibility of like, how are we channeling them? How are we moving through them? How are we responding and relating to these, these flows of energy, of sound, of physical sensation, of, of uh, past action, the formations, the results of past action, and then where do we take responsibility for them and recognize our own kama in them, right? This, this phrase, kama, karma, um, the sense of the, our, the only thing that we actually own, the only thing we're actually the inheritors of is, is of our own actions and of the motivating force behind our actions. And so there is this very powerful way that all the actions we do in the world, uh, if we see them at this sort of sacred point between the wildness that we experience and then the channeling of them into the, the canals and the irrigation forces of our consciousness, of our mind, of our lives, um, that there is a very powerful, I think, resonance in that metaphor and that experience that, that can acknowledge both the complexity and intensity of what we're inheriting every moment in terms of past action, right? There's this very powerful way in which these are understood, you know, uh, to be places where we are between realms, right? Where like springs or caves, uh, where there is the possibility of movement between realms and that we feel that right now, right? The sense that it's like the the ancestors are coming alive in this moment, right? It is, it's not even, it's not metaphorical, it's literal. It's like the actions of all past beings, all past action is unfolding and, and crashing down and coming to bear and coming to fruition in this moment. There's an aliveness to that. There's a responsibility that was generative and there's a responsibility that we bear in that. And then what do we, how do we take care? How do we manage the voltage, the floods that are coming through and making sure that we're not flooding the world downstream from us with our inability to attend to this, right? Where do we use our consciousness, our mind cultivation capacity to try to channel these in ways that are of benefit to ourselves and others? that are inspired by goodness, not by greed, hatred, delusion, impatience, arrogance, uh, some expectation of what we're going to get, rather than simply taking responsibility as best we can for these flows of experience, you know, moving through us. My father was from Ecuador and the last time um, I visited, which was quite a while ago now, uh, my cousins took me to a place 
outside of Quito where there was the this part powerful spring this the that was the head of a river that eventually would end up in the Amazon this uh, nacimiento this birthplace of the river and it was um just just this gushing force this incredible volatility of water bursting out of this uh spring in the mountain and creating this you know huge pool that you know people would play in and swim and enjoy um but that would of course over time just you know gather gather more and more streams as it went downhill gather more and more until it became you know part of an incredibly much larger river I, it, it, there was something so um intense of about the the volatility of this flood that um, made such an impression on me even now at this point so many years ago and I think that there's something important to recognize in that for for all of us the the present moment in many kind of you know modern new agey kind of world is is sort of talked about as sacred, but in a way where it's like, just come into the present moment and, and everything will be fine, right? That the present moment has this sort of natural quality somehow of being peaceful and beautiful and um, illuminated, you know, on its own. And um, that is not the perspective of this tradition. <laughs> and it's not the perspective of reality, right? That actually the present moment is this, totally wild uncontrollable flood of experience that is this kind of raging current of pleasant unpleasant and neutral experience and that's why no one's in the present moment right you th that's the reason we're running from it it's the reason the responsibility feels overwhelming and we're trying to distract ourselves and we're trying to cling on to what's pleasant and run from what's painful it's like the if the present moment was so wondrous we wouldn't be all terrified of it you know but here we are and we take off these little chunks of it. You know, we have this sense of like, where's the method that we can apply to start to show up for this responsibility that we have? Because even if we don't accept the responsibility, we have it, right? If we ignore the stream of experience that's coming through the senses, uh, we don't investigate it. We don't try to care for it. We don't try to build the capacity to be in healthy relationship with it, to take care of, of what we're building. It's like, you know, we build more aversion. We create more harm for ourselves. We create more addiction, more need, more pain, uh, more delusion in the world. We do have responsibility for that, whether we claim it or not. And so there is this invitation with our practice to, you know, to come to this sacred place and this river of experience to recognize that it is sacred, it is powerful, and it's very intense, it's very overwhelming. But like the, the, the question of why do we do it, again, it's like to be careful about our motivation, to not feel like it's like, oh, because we're going to get something out of it, you know, that it's going to make us the person we wish we were, that we're going to be better whatever, you know, parents, better workers, better, you know, whatever, drivers, golfers, uh, investors, you know, I mean, because there is now mindfulness for all of these things, you know, being sold to us out there. And so, you know, this sense of we do it because it's right, because we have responsibility to take care, right, that the sense of the goodness of what does it feel like to experience something painful, but to not let that not flood the the fields below us with that pain with our aversion to that pain with our inability to to really digest it how strong and supple the mind has to be to be able to feel the pain of loss the pain of uh, violence the pain of whatever it might be to feel it fully to integrate it into what we're building into the future but to build something beautiful, to build something useful, to build something wholesome, right? To then, to offer compassion, to offer care, to offer kindness. To really understand that we have this possibility 
and that it's all happening at these um, tinkwees, right? These incredible, uh, and it's happening all the time. You know, there's our formal meditation practice in the, the times in which it's like, okay, we're gonna really try to just sit in these places and, and, and bear the intensity of this flood of fabrications. But it's happening all the time, you know, and it's, it can be very hard to try to live into our, you know, deepest aspirations for our goodwill and generosity and patience when we're, you know, being, being flooded with these, you know, challenges all day long, all week long, all month long, all year long, all lifetime long, many lifetimes long. And so one way that we can do that is by starting to sort of slow down. You know, it sounds very simple. It sounds almost trite, um, but the reality is, is it's very hard to keep up with one moment of experience, one rising and one falling of the breath, one sound arising and passing. You can see how hard it is. And the more agitated we are, the busier we are, the faster we move, often that is not what doesn't help enable us to feel uh, capable of actually attending to the present moment, to the phenomena of the present moment in a way that actually develops these capacities. And I think, you know, now that many of us are, are uh, at home for longer periods of time, and while those, it also means we're responsible for a lot of things we might not normally be day in and day out if we're used to going to work or what have you, Sometimes the rush and the busyness is just a pattern. It's just a habit. There are times where we might really need to be busy and might really need to be moving around quickly. But there might be times where you can just attune to the sense of like, wow, this is really just a habit to be kind of focusing on the future moment versus standing in this, this, this place of convergence of the rivers, of the stream, and taking, it's that sense of where are we bringing, like when we're here on our low E, it's a sense of like, wow, our presence here has allowed us to actually show up for our responsibility. And the running around, the being busy, the, the kind of always being here or there, that's a version of not being here, right? It's a version of lack of presence. And so where is that sense of like, wow, when we slow down, when we really slow down our gestures, slow down our, how we're walking through the house, how we're opening doors, how we're brushing our teeth, that there's like a new capacity. It doesn't have to be going like at a snail's pace. Even just changing it a little bit can really help us feel like, wow, we're showing up in a different way. There's a presence there. There's an ability to attend to phenomena. The satipatthana, that thana is about attending to, being present with mindfulness, right, towards these objects. So where is that sense of our, our presence, our ability to be here, helps us show up with responsibility for what's happening? I think the other place I'll just maybe mention briefly as I think two places where the Vipassana practice can, can, can be illuminated by part of this metaphor. Some of it is again, this, the, the present moment, right? It's like, okay, showing up in the present moment experience in this way that is reflective of what's upstream and what's downstream between uh, nature and culture, between the wild and the cultivated and taking responsibility for the fields that we're cultivating downstream. The other is again this this idea of like these liminal spaces of transition between between phenomena, uh, between corresponding, complementary, or uh, or countervailing forces. That there is there is a relationship again in in terms of where you might look in your practice for this. It's about the present moment, but also in this relationship between mind and matter, uh, mentality and materiality. It's a classic insight um, place. Again, it's these moments, these, these places, these fields of, of where something is happening that's so fundamental to understanding, to insight, which is what is this relationship between mind and matter? What is the relationship between the intention to speak and the, and the voice? What is the 
relationship between the intention to act and the physical gesture, the intention to think and the, and the thought. What is the relationship between the physical sensation and the knowing of that? The consciousness that arises, the perspectives that arise, the opinions that arise. Where are we watching nama rupa, mentality, materiality, in the same way as an understanding of it's a very powerful and sacred place of, of creation, of construction, of, of dynamism, of uh, where forces are coming into interaction with one another, that we can start to understand the kind of process of becoming in a new way, in a very powerful and subtle way. Um, that's very important to look at. And I, let me just end with the a final uh, a framework around that that is more not from that tradition, but from the Hawaiian um, lineages. There's a powerful epic story um, of Hiiaka Ika Poleopele. It's this um, powerful epic story of Hiiaka, um, one of the sisters of Pele, the goddess of the volcano um, here and a, a journey she takes um, uh, on Pele's behalf. And there's a phrase in there The house of the coral lived in by the sea. The house of the sea lived in by the coral. Thus the pattern unfolds. The house of the coral dwelt in by the sea. The house of the sea dwelt in by the coral. Thus the pattern unfolds. There's some very powerful understanding in that, that again has to do with these dualities, with the relationship between these forces, phenomena that are in relationship with one another in a very mysterious and powerful way. That is a way that I deeply feel is, is, is of great value in terms of how we're looking at mind and matter, how we're looking at past and future, and the, the essential and fundamental um, location of that exploration, being in the present moment experience in the phenomena of mind and matter. So the present moment is the temporal aspect and the mind and matter is the phenomenological aspect, right? So that it's like in the phenomena of mind and matter in, as one sort of uh, flow and of past and present where those are meeting in this other flow, there's a matrix there of experience that we have the capacity and responsibility to be showing up for, to be investigating, to be bringing as much care and gentleness and patience and rigor and vigor and interest as we can in order to truly understand the nature of who we are, of what has been and what will be, and to, as best we can, be agents of goodness um, for whatever unfolds in the future. So um, we have some time now for questions, if anyone has any. Um, they can be about your practice. They can be about um, Michelle's instructions in regards to my talk. Um, but we do ask that they really be questions um, so that we can use the time to, to help you as much as possible in your, in your practice. Um, if you, I think, click on the participants little button there at the, on the side, you'll, you'll see a little s button where you can raise your hand um, in a not literal way. And that way we'll know that you have a question to ask. So feel free to raise your hand and, and we'll, we'll take some time for questions now.
not a question. Quinn has a question. Oh, oh, Quinn has a question. You're raising your hand literally. Here we go. Let me see if I can find you. Here we go. Oh, Quinn, can you unmute? There we go. Yes. Hi. Uh, Jesse, what uh, what you said was very beautiful and very powerful to me uh, to to try to show up for each moment and uh, to take ownership of that moment and yet to accept that you don't control it. For me, it's it's a huge task. So thank thank you. Uh, but I I have a question. Um, about the practice of Brahma Viharas. Uh, so when you, let's say, you try to bring on the loving kindness and uh, you send it to all 10 directions, you radiate it. Um, I had a recent very uh, strange experience in that instead of sending it out, I felt that I were receiving it from from the directions, from 10 directions. And I don't know whether it has been described that way or not in the practice. So that's my question. Okay. <laughs> See, do you wanna start with it? Michelle, you're muted still. I don't know if you uh, Thank you, Quinn. Yes, I know that experience too. At a, at a certain time uh, in, in practicing, particularly uh, as a either a daily practice or an intensive retreat practice, the the form the form falls away, the sense of radiation or extension or, or sending out uh, can completely drop. At at uh, one point, for example. In in the, um, in, the, in the initial training with Upandita, you know how one can also use the uh, the form of the phrases: "May you be safe, may you be happy, may you be healthy and strong, may you be able to look after yourself uh, ha uh, joyfully, gracefully, happily." Um, and at a, at a certain point of concentrated metta um, connection and kindness to all things he said to to drop all the conceptuality uh, including like this any sense of sending it in ten, in any direction the four directions and uh, above below and all around and so forth at that point i just felt no inside no outside uh, and uh, it, it actually felt more, as you described, uh, an unconditional, uncontrollable re receiving. Just a, uh, the, the, just in that, that, the term abiding most captures that to me. A complete oneness with the, with the metta. No sense of it, more of a sense of just being the metta. So that that was my experience, but I wouldn't even use the word receiving. It was it was just the complete oneness, the metta, and everything was metta, through the eyes, through the ear, through all the sense doors, through the body, through the mind door, uh, the emot emoting and so forth. There there was no here, no there, no outside, no inside. Uh, so so it's quite it's quite. Um, uh, it's not infrequent with someone like yourself who's been practicing for many years to suddenly drop into that complete unconditional abiding. There's a powerful, we use that term a lot, but the actual experience of abiding is totally non-conceptual. A, a complete pre-verbal, pre-conceptual experience there's, there's no barrier no no boundary no barrier no, barrier no boundary whatsoever 
Yeah. So all the directionality disappeared. It jumps, yeah. The sense of it coming from anyone, including ourself, disappeared. Yeah. Thank you. I think, I think some, oh. Go ahead, you go first, yeah. Well, just quickly, I mean, I do think there's something I have felt for myself and just seen more and more with people is that we're, we're all just oriented a little bit differently <clears throat> and that there are going to, there are just sometimes people for whom the like sending meta is their thing. It's like, it's just natural and they love it. And they're just, they're like, oh, we're just trying to shoot meta out at everyone. And, and they're like a type, you know, and then there's like other types for whom it actually like that's sort of exhausting or it feels fake, it feels phony, right? And I, and maybe I would say a little bit, it's greedy types that tend to, uh, it's like if, if greed is your strongest, um, you know, uh, <laughs> problem, uh, it's like for some reason, those people, there's an enthusiasm, right? Because they, lo they love that feeling and there's like that goodness to it. And aversive types who are like, where aversion, aversion is sort of like your strongest, you know, kind of fallback, tend to, find that to be often have a hard time where that feels like a little more phony and and so that they can find that actually the sort of sense of receiving or just a sense of abiding um in the sort of the, the permeation of just the feeling of metta it doesn't need to be kind of cranked out in any direction um is something that is a little bit perhaps more inclined and aligned with the practice of equanimity, which might be a little bit more their natural orientation or their natural kind of medicine. Um, so I think that sometimes we just find that about ourselves of like, oh, actually I have this interesting, it's actually, it might be end up being that this was like a once experience for you. And it might be that actually you start to feel like this is actually your more natural way of doing metta. So I would say keep practicing and exploring it. You know, it might be just like, that's actually exactly. a more natural entry point. Yeah. yeah. Mm. I, I have one thing to add. Am I muted or not? Mm -mm. Okay. Um, I think just, I think this is such an important discussion around um, our experience of subject and object and duality. And when that duality subject of object disappears and there's abiding and there is no sense of a me or a you or an us often it just all drops away and just to re the reminder to be careful of making um, our experience of receiving or sending not as good as when that disappears and there's an abiding so just to be in this is where wisdom and the vipassana practice are so important where we don't set up a hierarchy as of one experience being better than the other as much as what's possible and what what's actually happening so if if, if sending is the only thing we can happen do go for it or if receiving go for it or if abiding great go for it but to not set up oh this is better than the other as much as it's all like something we can cultivate and have skillful means with uh, depending on the conditions in any given moment. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, thank you, Michelle. That's also my experience is uh, the, the practice flows in every which way it wants. Yeah, yeah. And so, yes. When thank you me. look at the sort of normal thought stream of a human being, being able to send metta or to receive it or abide in any of it is great to not um, make one better than the other one will feel more um, uh, less dualistic and more deep like the word deep comes to mind with that it'll be like more um, when subject object drops away it feels more true or real but it doesn't negate duality. We're not trying to negate duality. Thanks, Queen. Oh, Tang? Tang? Oh, we got to unmute you again. Let's see. <laughs> this is a question is for Steve. Uh, it's about 
collective karma. I I don't know how, what Steve think about this pandemic that we are having now. Is that a collective karma of, about what we did in the past as a people? <laughs> I I heard Steve you are Steve. talk about yeah, <laughs> collective karma before many years ago. So I don't know whether <laughs> he changed his mind or he has more input. I'd like to hear him again. I hope not. I'm afraid so, and I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> good question, good answer. Well, one time, I can add that um, when Sera Upandita came to the big island of Hawaii, I think I forget what year, I think it was 1986, um, at the end of the retreat, somebody asked him um, whose karma it was that when the volcano went off. Yeah, good question, yeah. Yeah, and um, he said it was Pele's karma, but everybody who lived on the island's karma. Yeah, it, was, it was the Pele, the volcano goddesses, he called her Pele Devi. I love the way he talked of her Pe with such reverence. He called her Pele Devi. It was so beautiful. And then everybody there on the island, at whenever that happens at that time, that it's everybody's karma. Yeah, I see. Hal CK. Hi. Hey. Uh, I think I think what Queen said, like along with that, and knowing what's what's good and what works, and and then there's always part of me that I'll figuring things out and like trying to fix it. I was like, oh no, uh, non conceptual. It's okay, but but still, like in in a, it's okay. I'm still trying to figure it. Oh yeah, th like this is working and. There's a constant like tink tinkering happening. Um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I mean that's that happens and that happens, but uh, like, oh, <laughs> why? <laughs> yeah, I mean it's I. I'll I mean, I'll just start of like I think it's. You know, I mean, it's classic, of course, right? I'm sure everyone here is like, gets that, right? It's like, oh, you're trying to do this meta, and maybe you're feeling some sense of love and kindness and you're feeling connection, but then there's this, there's always this sort of persistent voice of like, oh, this is working or this isn't working or just sort of evaluating and trying to manage it. And well, maybe I should do this and maybe I should do that. And, you know, just the, the relentlessness of the, I, what I would say that, you know, what I would offer maybe is it's like, it's not always just the same thing. It isn't just like, oh, we're, why is the mind always dissatisfied? Or why is the mind always looking for what's better? You might like investigate the, the tone kind of of the voice that's doing that and maybe start to appreciate pieces of it, right? Of like, there's one side of it that's like, there's what, what is wrong with that? What is wrong with the mind really wanting to be better at feeling love and kindness. You know what I mean? Like there's a way that it can drive us crazy, but on the other hand, it's like, well, of course we want to be better at that. <laughs> like, of course, of course we want to be able to like have a stronger, deeper, longer lasting connection with the feeling of love and care. And so, you know, there's another part of it that you might interpret those voices, those internal voices also in a different way of like, oh, it's not just the mind pestering or it's not just the mind being dissatisfied. It's also the mind like longing for freedom and wanting to find the best way and, and maybe some anxiety around that or pressure or, or a sense of, uh, you know, worry around it or something. But those might be places where you can actually fold in then, fold in whatever anxiety or worry or, agitation that might be there into the metta practice, right? So that it's not like, oh, well, I'm trying to practice metta for this thing over here and my worry is in the way. It's like, well, maybe the worry is 
when you can fold it in or the caring about yourself, right? The sense of like, oh, I really want to be happy. That is folded into the metta practice in a way that actually strengthens it versus thinking that it's a distraction or something that's, um, you know, diverting the, the stream of, of, of kindness in a different direction, you know? I don't know. You all have other... Yeah, I have something to say. Mm. The, 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 sim, the simultaneous streams um, that I've spoken of, that many of you who have sat with uh, and heard me say this before, a, tremen a tremendous understanding, release, letting go. At one point, I've been practicing with Sayara Upadita, when he said side by side with that with that the mind who the mind that's commenting or wondering or pressuring or pushing striving or um, being confused side by side with that because we set the intention to practice whether it's loving kindness or the wisdom practice vipassana that that is still developing so the two the, the two realities are there, side by side. The, the simultaneity of we could say the, the conceptual mind, the ruminating mind, the wanting to know mind, and then the mind that's just natural, the meditative mind that's just naturally developing. The, all, all the uh, the wisdom factors like courageous energy and concentration, unity and the intuitive understanding, the loving kindness, the Brahma Viharas, the generosity, that that's just happening. And just let it be that way. <laughs> I, I, I just, I've been really comfortable with that ever since. And sometimes, you know, sometimes I don't like the loudness of the conceptual stream, but then I just don't like the loudness of the conceptual stream. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's not liking. And then the realization that, yeah, every once in a while, I feel the unity mind. I feel the intuitive mind, the wisdom mind is still streaming, unfolding, developing. I could add one little thing. I think um, this is more basically saying what Steve and Jesse said in a little different way, and that um, that stream of dissatisfaction or con conceptual, or the judge, the critic, the tinkerer, the manipulator, you know, we can, we can send metta to that. So just that directly, just like if you feel that tinkerer, uh, there was a great Zen teacher named San Sanim who called that part of us the backseat driver. And I love that. You just, you see that backseat driver just, just like talking and, or wearing, as Jesse's saying, talking. And it's like, um, I hear it as a, as a sound. And you can, however you relate to it, I used to work for years with that as an image of a backseat driver. I think it's a great image. And, you know, what Satsanim used to just describe it as like turning around and saying, shut up, you know, but it doesn't work, right? Like, shut up, you know, but it's like instead you, you shift to like just as Steve and Jesse are saying, accepting it and then ultimately sending metta to that part of us, you know. And I think sometimes it's also a problem of we all we all want freedom and we want happiness and we want to be liberated from, you know, all these entanglements. And that's so beautiful and necessary and powerful. And sometimes it does entangle us in another trap of like going longing for some big intense experience of unity or oneness or just open heartedness. And like while those things happen there is that sense of like, how much are we perhaps missing and dismissing 
more subtle but very real and powerful moments of connection and care and tenderness you know and and is there a way that like a little bit of tenderness just a moment of it with your own mind or with your own aversion or our own sadness or what have you it's like it might not sort of you know bowl us over and be some story we tell someone about but it's like if we can connect it's like it's partly why we tend to not teach the loving kindness, compassion, appreciative joy, and equanimity practices so much as fixed concentration practices. That is a way to, to practice them, right? Where you're just, you're just honing in on this one thing and you're, you're building this like intense concentration and that sort of, you know, gets more, you know, it's like we are often teaching them in a more Vipassana style, like Steve is saying, a little more momentary. And so you, if you're going to do that, you also have to be willing to take in these little drops of tenderness. You know, it's like that, that phrase that, you know, the sea is great because it doesn't refuse water from even the smallest stream. It's like that is the the quality of connection. It's like if we can keep a little bit of sense of a little bit of tenderness over time, that that actually does build that deeper reservoir, even though each moment of it might not feel like is satisfying that sort of deeper thirst we have. You know? mm. Mm, thanks, Kay. Um, let's see, Catherine? Hi, that's me, Kathy. Hi. Oh, hey, Kathy. <laughs> you know, the computer names itself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I think what I, it's not, a, I don't know, it was a question and then everybody started talking, but it started with Quinn, you know, talking about, you know, receiving rather than sending and then, you know, Michelle talking and then Steve, but mine is a little bit different because what I, if I first wanted to ask, is there a difference between meditation and being in the present moment? Because my experience, you know, partly because we're in a pandemic, and then my, I guess the quality of my life recently is that, you know, I'll be somewhere or be doing something. And, you know, I tend to be the aversive type, as you were talking about. And the intensity of that feeling, and then suddenly, you know, I mean, I might be driving to the store, and then my anxiety, of course, because I'm going to be in a crowd or something, or because life is kind of intense right now. And then all of a sudden, there's clarity. I mean, I'm not trying, you know, like when I'm sitting or, you know, doing metta or, you know, any of the practices, and it just is clear, you know which is so shocking. I mean, it's the opposite of what we're doing. And it just happens like that in my life a lot. I mean, happily a lot, you know, otherwise I think Harry would go bananas. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, is that, you know, it was kind of what Steve was talking about, the two streams or something. I mean, but do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Like, is that what we're looking for? Is that what we're doing? Is that daily practice? I mean, I don't know, or should I not be trying to label this? I just am trying to, anyway, do you guys get what I'm trying to ask? I got your first question, and I can respond to that. Thank you. Is there a difference between meditation and being in the present moment? So going to the source of the the Pali term for meditation, bhavana, means the cultivation and development of the beautiful states of heart or consciousness. The term satipatthana is a, that pre-verbal present time grounded awareness, one of the beautiful states of the heart. One and the same. If you're doing one, you're doing the other. Okay, it doesn't last all that long. But <laughs> it's great. What one, one moment of awareness is more powerful than a million unmindful moments. You know, and then when you're there, it's just like, it's okay. It's okay. Everything. Everything is, okay. is as I mean, it is. 
it's an understanding of the as it is nature of things in the Pali, the uh, yata bhuta, as it is, is upandita. Why are we practicing upandita? That would say yata bhuta, as it is, just with things as they are. It's just all okay. And they wouldn't be happening spontaneously if you hadn't practiced in the past intentionally you know i mean i think how they're related over time and what feels spontaneous and what feels you know it's all kama right it, you're you are you are be- receiving the fruit of your past actions in this way right? it's like you have developed the capacity of the mind to do this and then it arises you know based on different kinds of conditions or whatever but i think that it's um well, all know. those sittings when i was just sitting and you know, <laughs> miserable this is what it happens okay i'll take that <laughs> exactly all those years of why am i doing this <laughs> no but that's the truth that's actually the truth thank you yeah thank the pandemic <laughs> uh, mm. So good to, it's so good to hear this from you, Kathy. I have all of you to thank. Uh, Tracy? Hi. Hi there. Um, so I, I really appreciate the talk tonight because it really spoke to where I'm at, the, the piece about the being in the present moment and how overwhelming that can be um, and is. <laughs> um, I've, I've had some fear and aversion come up really strongly today and then there's this awareness that um (laughs) that i had i'd gotten through some of gotten through some of that and i thought you know the mind thought it wasn't going to come back but i didn't know that that i thought that (laughs) you know but it's very clear and so there's this aversion to the aversion But what the the kind of the fear that's coming up is just around, I I can even feel in my body right now, like, like, like about just how vulnerable everything is. And some of it's just, you know, the big global perspective of that and some of those, these personal very personal relationships and, and things happening in it to some people that I love um, and so doubt comes in too that says you know why why are you doing this your practice just makes you more sensitive you know so I would love a little feedback because part of the question my mind is like how do I stand this? How do I trust this? Even though this life, while being connected to how vulnerable everything is, it just feels hard right in this moment. So um, So what sensations do you feel in your body connected to vulnerability right now? Just, just the heart is um, just like quivering and my body is. And... Can you put your hand by your heart? Yeah. Can you feel that contact, pressure, touching, warmth? And quivering, moving, trembling. Two, both. 
both of those. Can you feel the care? We call it care, caring, caring for the vulnerability, caring for the trembling. Feeling a breath within all of that, trembling, caring, trembling, touching, warmth. <laughs> Feeling that release, the beautiful smile. <laughs> When this came up earlier, I tried to see if compassion was there. Mm. And it, like, it's like it came to here. It was mm -hmm. like I could just, like, I couldn't. And, and then I just had to, like, that's how it was. You know, mm. I just couldn't, you know. So anyway, I feel so grateful for these meetings to connect. And those Dharma tears too. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. There is a. Am I on? Mm -hmm. There yeah. is a. There is a backseat driver that we like. You know, really, it's like we we want the backseat driver to shut up, but sometimes we the backseat driver goes disappears, and there's there's nothing helping us connect with the fear, so that's what. Steve just brought in a part of you that can care, right? That's a, a compassionate backseat driver is great, right? <laughs> yeah, no, but I'm yeah. the, the, the judge that says, you know, okay, we're, we're actually over this. We shouldn't be having this fear come up anymore, right? Like that right. judge and that idea, the idea that one is ahead of that or we've progressed beyond it versus remembering that we're trying to get a relationship of kindness with whatever appears and that fear is totally worthwhile and you know worth our attention and it's that it's that hatred of it the yeah. hatred it's we we all learn a certain aversion to vulnerability it's like the reason the planet's such a mess is because we're the human condition is to hate that vulnerability right so that it's learning learning again and again and again that when you get that part back you and you feel connected with yourself with care it doesn't necessarily mean that you make the fear pleasant right you're not trying to make the fear that might be unpleasant you're not trying to make things pleasant that are unpleasant but you've ex that acceptance of it makes it completely okay to work with And it's often, again, that idea that it shouldn't, somehow we're, you know, we, we're above, we're above this fear versus, um, oh boy, here it is again. You know, I was hoping I'd get more practice with fear. I don't think I've totally convinced you of that. <laughs> no, it's very I'm helpful. I'm, I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking too, like, it's like all those things were there, you know, in, in my mind, you know, like I was, I, and, and I also like, I just couldn't connect, but, and I knew I couldn't. So it's like being with that, that's frustrating mm. <laughs> being patient. So, I mean, under the covers, okay. I give, I give, Michelle. Your mic has dropped to your throat. There you go. So you say it's not possible, not possible. It's okay, it's okay, it's, it's okay. Thank you. There's a, there's a story about from Rumi <laughs> that's I always like, but it's a little intense, you know. This, um this guy, he, you know, he's, he's old and he, he finally has gotten to a place in his life where he can, you know, his, 
his farm is on its own. He can leave for a little while and he can finally go to Mecca for his pilgrimage, which is, you know, the once in his lifetime he's always wanted to do. So he gets his camel ready and he gets his gear ready and he, you know, gets on this kind of ready for this long journey to Mecca across the desert. And, you know, he's, he's so motivated. He's so excited. You know, he's so moved. Um, but his camel is not really that excited and that moved and really kind of just wants to go back to home and it's hay and it's other camel friends and be taken care of. So every night he just decides to sleep on the camel. So he's going, you know, however many miles during the day and at night he falls asleep. And at night when he falls asleep, the camel turns around and goes, heads back home. And he wakes up and he realizes like, ah, he's almost back home. And so he uh, turns the camel around and he heads, tries to head back to Mecca. And this goes on night after night. And he realizes like, if I, if I keep doing this, I'm never going to make it to Mecca, you know? So he decides I'm going to send the camel home. I'm just going to go on foot. And he jumps off his camel and he sprains his ankle and the camel runs home. And there he is in the middle of the desert on his way to Mecca. And I think, and that's the story. Uh, <laughs> and I think it's actually like a great kind of metaphor of our spiritual life of like you, it's like you're motivated and you, you know, you, 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 you want to sort of have this purity of heart. And then there's this period of time where it's like, and then not just period of time, it's, it's not like so linear, but you fall back upon your more basic with Rumi was calling the sort of animal side of ourselves, right? The part of us that just wants to be comfortable, just wants to go home, doesn't want to be involved in the spiritual quest, just like wants things to be the way they are. And at some point you realize like you can't do both. You actually need to kind of commit. And so you make that commitment, but it's incredibly hard. You, the camel goes home. You don't have that defense anymore to just go home yeah. and feel the security. And yet there you are wounded in the desert trying to get to, you know, your Mecca. And, and I do think that there's just like, we hit these places in our practice where you see the you know, the, the tendencies that are still there and alive and well to find refuge in aversion or sadness or wanting or whatever, but you also don't buy into them as much. You know, they don't lead you where do you want to go. But on the other hand, the mindfulness isn't always strong enough. The metta isn't always strong enough. And so we're just, you know, in these, a lot of our spiritual life is more in this place of just like, of not feeling like, of course, we all fall back on our things anyway at some point, but there's time where you, 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 you lose the taste for it. You lose the taste for what was providing you a sense of safety before because you know it's not real safety. And yet you're also not at Mecca. And so it's just the, it's a, it's a beautiful place to be. And it's a sign of your commitment and of your, you know, the, the beauty of the commitment you've made and, and where you are in your practice. But it also is like, it's more intense and it just, it gets more intense and, and it's beautiful. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Hmm. Well, I think we probably should wrap up for today. Um, again, just, yeah, as, as Steve and Michelle were mentioning earlier, it's wonderful to just be here again with everyone, see you all. Uh, Julie asked a question here about the, an upcoming retreat at Sea to Sky. Um, you can look at our website, vipassanahawaii.org, and see the retreats that we're leading. There should also be, so this, this particular retreat that she's asking about, which was going to happen in, in British Columbia in the end of August, there will be an online version. It's just going to be a weekend, a three-day thing. Um, but if you can't yet tonight get a link to it on our website, um, I will put one up soon. Um, also the Br BCIMS, British Columbia Insight Meditation Society through their website. Um, they um, are taking registrations for that. We've just settled on some dates for ourselves. The uh, Vipassana Hawaii will hold another like 10 day retreat, um, September like 4th through 13th, I think. We're also going to try to do a five-day retreat in November. So anyway, these things will be up on our, on our website and our calendar, and you, you can look at them as they come to fruition. Um, yeah. Mm. Well, take care, everybody. Um, good luck out there. Good luck in there. <laughs> <laughs> and we will, we'll, we'll see you next week again, for sure.
Michelle, your mic is. What? There we go. I'm not saying anything. <laughs> You're just going. Meta. Karuna. <laughs> Mudita. Upeka. Rene. <laughs> Is that Tim? Yeah. Oh, oh. Right mm. below Steve, Tim Clinton. Yeah, William, Susan. Oh. Oh, William. Aloha. Karen, Ian, Rama. Hey. Swan. Thomas. Some people seem to appear out of nowhere. They went on there before, and then they're there. I know. Causes and conditions. Phenomena. <laughs> well, have a good week.